original, super fun, and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. I hope you are doing very, very well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition, traditional food prep and storage, traditional cooking, and of course, traditional artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition to your life. So the tradition of dairying has been around for thousands of years. Today in the United States, the number of small dairy farms continues to decline. We are one of the few who are adding to it. Uh, The desire for fresh and nutritious, uh, the desire for the fresh and nutritious commodity we call milk remains steady. And uh, today it's mostly fulfilled by these gigantic mega dairies. And as with anything else, the bigger it gets, the cheaper it gets. Um, and the small farmer, of course, gets pushed out on that. But on the other side of the corn, coin, you, you probably also know that the bigger it gets, the less concerned the producer is with the nutrition and the health of the livestock. We see lots of stories about that. Um, they simply need to meet their goals for the bottom line as cheaply as possible. Um, and in the United States, we have become consumers of cheap goods quality that was valued above cheap back in the 50s and 60s um, seems to be nearly extinct in this country. But uh, when I was growing up, uh, you wanted quality, not cheap. But times have changed. But I think we will circle back around. So let's talk about some homestead life updates. I'm going to talk about the tradition of dairying. And our recipe today is going to be ghee or clarified butter. It's a kind of clarified butter. All right, our homestead uh, life updates. Well, hmm. we have both happy and sad news this week. Um, If you're on our mailing list, you received a newsletter on Wednesday in which I shared the great news of our first calf uh, just two days earlier. Um, and you can get on our mailing list at, uh, by going to www.peacefulheartfarm.com and entering your name and email address. And I send out an, a newsletter once a week and it highlights this podcast. I'm going to put, uh, some of the recent recipes I've had in the podcast podcast. I'll have some pretty interesting articles that I've come across from time to time and, uh, as well as other, uh, tidbits that, uh, might be of interest, uh, to those of you who follow me. Join us, please. We'd love to have you ride along with us on the homestead journey. So the day after the newsletter was published, we had very sad news. The cow who had delivered the calf died. Uh, She had a very virulent systemic infection that resulted from her difficult birth. The calf was a breech and we thought she was going to be fine the day of the birth. I mean, she, she didn't seem to do okay. And even the next day, but the third day she was despondent, not eating and isolating herself. And I had had the vet on the phone all three days. The first day when, you know, she had to come out and help, uh, pull that calf. And then the second day she was checking up on her. And then, um, the third day, uh, we talked about what we could do for her despondency, but, um, It was only hours between the despondency of the morning and her ultimate demise. It was very, very fast. Um, Her name was Dora. It's short for adorable. Uh, She was the most adorable calf. In fact, that is her picture on our home page. It's a picture of her sitting uh, curled up in a little bit of grass. Um, That picture has been there for years, welcoming, welcoming you all to our site with her adorableness and we miss her so and her calf missed her so also but he's doing he's doing splendidly now and he follows us around like a puppy we call him trooper as far as the garden goes i still don't have the strawberries planted that's on the docket from monday i had to replant some of the cabbage due to it getting frosted and stunted so bad that i thought it was better just to start over with some more well-established plants Cold weather plants 
they have to be planted early but not too early or they get frosted as these did and then but they must mature before it gets too hot so it's a, it's a delicate balance there with the spring crops the creamery walls are still rising it's a beautiful site it's going to be a beautiful dairy and creamery um, speaking of which, let's get to the, co the topic of the day, the tradition of dairying. We love it and can't imagine doing anything else at this point. And sure, it's a lot of work, but so worth it, so fulfilling. Uh, and we hope to pass on the tradition of dairying to the next generation, you know, keeping it alive far into the future. We're not going to let these big mega companies completely wipe out our small dairy traditions. Uh, the tradition of dairying in its most reductionist form is merely swiping some milk from a cooperative grazing animal. And it goes back many thousands of years, back into prehistory. Uh, it goes back so far that there isn't a real fix on it. It is known that Laplanders herded and milked reindeer 11,000 years ago. And 30,000 years ago, people in the High Sinai were confining and breeding antelope with the aid of fences. Um, that was a human invention, arguably as important as the spear. Wherever antelope, reindeer, sheep, camels, goats, or cattle have been brought under human control, they've been milked. Among the very earliest human artifacts are vessels containing milky residues. Even horses have been milked. The hordes of Genghis Khan swept out of Asia eight centuries ago on these tough, speedy horses, and they triumphed everywhere because of two important military advantages. Number one, they used stirrups, thus freeing both hands to use weapons, and they had a lightweight, high-protein food source, always handy, mare's milk. Ingenious, uh, ingeniously dried by their wives prior to their raids. Each day, a horseman would put about half a pound of dried milk into a leather pouch. They added water, and by dinner time, he had a tasty fermented yogurt-like food. So, no army travels very far or fights very well without provisions. And so, they have these supply wagons. But Genghis Khan didn't have to wait for the quartermaster to catch up with his speedy horses. So he always maintained the advantage of surprise. He could move much faster than people would have thought because of mare's milk. Isn't that interesting? Now, on the other hand, you have more peaceable folks. They milked goats and sheep. And sheep, sheep and goats had the advantage of being able to thrive on steep rocky land and they reproduced rapidly gestation only takes five months for sheep and goats it's nine months in cows and a full year for donkeys uh, so and also goats and sheep often have twins and their uh, uh, a, a doe or a, a ewe the females uh, are often old enough to breed by the time they're one year old so basically, they actually get bred before they're one month old or one year old, sorry. And then they'll have their first uh, offspring at the time that they are one year old. Cows need at least 15 to be at least 15 months old before being bred. And then you, they're giving birth no earlier than two years of age. So you can see there's a, a whole year's difference in how quickly you can have um, offspring from your goats and your sheep. Um, but wherever people have the choice and the needed resources, they do choose the cow. Uh, so long ago was she chosen and so much was she valued that wild ancestors from the cow vanished many hundreds of years ago. The last known wild cow died over 500 years ago in Poland. Cows were integral in a relationship with humans at least 10,000 years earlier than that, at least. They've been lovingly nurtured and defended throughout Africa, Asia, and Europe ever since. The cows live in symbiosis with us humans. Now, 
archaeologists and anthropologists have shown much greater interest in the role of grains in human history. Speaking of what came before as mere herding of animals. In fact, discussions of modern diet seem oblivious to the long prehistory of herding. So arable farming or growing grain began about 10,000 years ago. This is an unknown number of years after dairying was already being practiced, as I just talked about. Possibly as early as 30,000 years ago. But most writers link arable farming together with animal husbandry, apparently assuming that they sprang up together, and it's just not true. It's often stated in otherwise well-researched sources that dairy products are a comparatively recent addition to the human men, uh, menu. And to the contrary, grain is the recent inclusion in the human diet, not dairy foods. This false assumption about dairy foods is apparently linked to the widespread belief that milk production is dependent upon grain. It is not. They eat grass. And to pr produce grain and in, in any useful qualities, it requires rich wetlands uh, such as floodplains, and it requires a large amount of energy, available antiquity uh, only where complex cultures had developed. This energy was produced by slaves. The more slaves you had, the more grain you could grow. And the more grain you could grow, the more slaves you could afford, thus giving rise to a wealthy class able to afford monumental tombs and other durable artifacts of uh, civilization. But grazing animals have been around for millions of years thriving on grass. They are not dependent on grain. For many thousands of those years, they were herded and milked, tasks which require neither slaves nor even permanent dwellings. The herd animals requires only the availability of shepherds and can be done on any kind of land from Rocky Mountain sides to the beach. Wherever herbivores have been herded, their milk as well as their meat became important parts of the human diet. The fact is that herbivores transform grass, bushes, and weeds into high-grade, readily available food. They do this with enormous efficiency, whether in captivity or not. Remember the great herds of buffalo on the plains? No grains, just grass. And they turn that into food. We can't eat the grass. They can eat the grass, and then they produce food for us. Grain is not necessary in the diet of grazing animals. Now, where it is available in excess of human requirements, it can be fed to animals to fatten them and as an extra energy source. We use it as a supplement when the cows are lactating. They get just a couple of handfuls of specially prepared supplement twice a day during milking. You know, it takes a lot of energy to produce the milk in the quantities that they provide. The health of our animals is at the top of our list of desired goals. They can survive just fine on their own on grass, but when they're sharing their resources with us, we make sure that they get some daily candy to make sure they keep up their strength. And it, it works really well. Um, and historically, let me talk about the fences that came up because they serve less to keep animals from running away than to protect them from the, prote the predators at night. Um, there are ancient Sumerian writings that reveal that it also provided a means for keeping the best milk producing animals close at hand. But again, this is only feasible where there are servants available to fetch and carry uh, feed to the milking animals. And the downside of fencing is that it forfeits the transcendent advantage of the grazing animal that it finds its own foods. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later how the cow has gone be beyond the ability to be able to just go out there and uh, perform that uh, transcendent advantage of just being able to survive out on the plains. The fence served another uh, function basic to animal husbandry. 
it permitted it permitted selective breeding of cattle, sheep, goats, all of that, by combining uh, the smaller and more docile males, you know, and only per- per- permitting these to breed. Um, so at least 10,000 years ago, people were manipulating animal genetics to create the domestic breeds that we have now. Um the breeds, they began to have smaller horns and they began to be smaller of more manageable size and temperament. Um, the old wild cows were really huge beasts. Um, so this is particularly important in the case of cattle, which like all dairy animals are often handled by women and children. So they needed to be small, manageable size and have a good temperament. Um, again, those, those original wild cattle, they were huge and quite dangerous. Um, and although in actual numbers worldwide, there have always been more sheep and goats being milked than cows. The cow very early on in human history became the most prized of the dairy animals. It takes five goats to make one cow. And I think even, well, maybe not five goats, it takes five sheep to make the same uh, amount of milk as a cow. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Anyway, it takes a lot more sheep and goats to to make the same amount of milk as a cow. So the cow is the premier dairy animal, and it's because of the cooperative temperament, the cooperative e- the comparative ease where uh, she can be milked and the volume she's able to produce, and because of the versatility of cow's milk. The cream is easily skimmed, and then you can make it into much prized butter and ghee. And ghee is butter that's been melted, rendered, and strained. That's going to be today's recipe. Just a reminder on that. You'll find that uh, recipes are free to be downloaded at our website. The link will be in the show notes. There'll be links also in the newsletter. Again, www.peacefulheartfarm.com and sign up for our newsletter so you can uh, get access to that information. Lots and lots of free information out there. All right, so um, the cow. The cow is a primary producer of wealth. She can support a family. She not only turns grass into milk in sufficient quantities to feed a family, but also provides extra to sell, and she contributes a yearly calf to be reared and fattened. Um, And the byproducts from cheese making, the whey, and from butter, the buttermilk, that will support a pig or two. Her manure improves her her own pasture and and when you dig that into the garden the, it results in plant growth that cannot be surpassed by other growth mediums that's the whole return to the organic growth it's it's cow manure is what they're using on these organic gardens so the family that takes a uh, good care of its cow is well off indeed and as i mentioned earlier the cow is now forever domesticated other domestic animals can revert to a wild or feral state with predictable success like you put a hog in the woods and they won't look back and they won't get fat but they will immediately form a breeding population um, and they breed pretty quickly they grow out pretty quickly horses on the plains they will be able to breed sometimes they have trouble find to these days finding enough uh, grass to eat uh, but they will survive out there as long as they have grass to eat Many breeds of sheep can establish themselves in hill country, and goats are well known for this aptitude. So long as they're not too far from the sea, they have a high iodine requirement. Um, But cows are dependent on humans for their survival as a species at this point in their evolution. So Huckleberry Finn's pap might have had a pig or a goat he could turn loose and still call his own, but a cow requires consistent, responsible care. If she doesn't get it, she won't give milk, she won't start a new calf, and she won't live through much cold or drought. Now also, she created the surrounding community. A dairy cow doesn't ask for much, but she asks every day. Historically, People creating wealth with the cow either are hardworking and reliable or they get that way in a hurry. And this is the way it has been for a very long time. The fine farms of Europe, England, New England, and much of the United States were all established thanks to the wealth derived from cows. 
Wherever there is or used to be a big barn, it was built to store winter hay for the cows, which once dotted the pastures. The, the need to milk a cow twice a day determined the location of churches. People had to be able to walk there and back without disruption to the milking schedule of cows. Formerly, every district in Europe, England, and the eastern United States had a corn mill situated so that a far farmer driving a horse and wagon could deliver his load of corn and still get home in time for milking. So all of that infrastructure revolves around the proximity to the dairy cow. And it's certainly no coincidence that such a large number of our finest American statesmen were born on farms. Important virtues are nurtured on the farm including a graphic understanding of the relationship between working and eating. Homestead living is making a resurgence in the, in, resurgence in the U.S. for just those reasons. Moms and dads want to raise their children to be virtuous. A farmstead with a milk cow goes a long way toward accomplishing that. So at this point, you might be asking, if cows are so great, why doesn't everybody have one? Well, not so very long ago, a great many people did indeed keep a cow. And she was often an adored member of the family. Well-to-do families, even in cities, kept a cow well into the early part of the 20th century. During the Victorian era, era country homes of wealthy included charming accommodations for their cow. Some of these were quite fanciful and included beautifully tiled dairy rooms for making butter and cheese. All of this attested to the high regard in which the dairy cow and dairy products were held. Peasant homes were built to take advantage of considerable heat given off by a cow. In Scotland, often the cottage was built to surround a stall in which the cow spent the winter. So picture an arrangement like a playpen in the middle of a low ceilinged room. In other locales, including Spain, the family lived in rooms above the cows, using them like a furnace in the basement. Some of the forces that stopped cow keeping uh, were the same ones that have stressed the American family today. Um, an insatiable desire for consumer goods, focusing the whole energy of the family on acquisition of every imaginable gadget was certainly a factor. But the automobile was important. It dispersed families and directed interest away from home-based activities. A rising desire for consumer goods fostered a yearning for enhanced social status. It wasn't good enough to be a farmer. Like, oh, farmer. I mean, that still persists today. People say, oh, you're a farmer. Like, oh, you're so much smarter than that. And I'm like, yeah, well. And there, there have been eras, and actually there still remain places in the world where the cow still is accorded status. But uh, nowadays in the U.S. status is more likely to be derived from real estate in a good location. If it's a country property, the high status animal is now the horse. We call them hay burners. They provide no sustenance for the family, but they sure do eat a lot themselves. But all these factors are as chaff compared to the power of the 20th century revolution in food production, processing, and distribution. This is where the small farm really took a hit. The food revolution, revolution is um, it's lauded in school text and political speeches virtually everywhere as it's an exemplary modern triumph that has showered us with endless choice and plenty. And occasionally there are warnings from farmers and homesteaders like me. Uh, we point out that the current food system is extremely wasteful, definitely nutritionally compromised. But the most astonishing feature of this food revolution is usually overlooked. For all of human history until very recently, and still for many people living in the world today, Food is something you find 
you grow, you fish from the sea, or you obtain locally from the actual producer. The purpose of this food is straightforward and obvious. It's to feed people. If sold, it changes hands only once. It goes directly to people who intend to eat it. Designer food intended only as a source of profit arrived late in man's history. The foods in our shiny supermarkets were produced as a financial investment. They are not so much food as consumer goods. As the primary constituents of the majority of finished goods, the wheat, corn, edible oils, and sugar cane, or sugar beets, are grown as a monoculture on millions of flat acres. They're traded on the stock market. The constituents are broken down and reassembled into something that keeps nicely on the shelf. And it vaguely resembles food. As for milk, because of its extremely perishable nature, milk initially presented a challenge. In the late 19th century, as the size of American cities rapidly expanded, the demand for milk was met in several ways. One enterprising solution was to position a great barn full of cows right downtown next to the inevitable brewery. The cows were fed the spent malt. In theory, this could have proved satisfactory. In practice, it was disgusting. The cows were kept in filth. They were milked by hand by anybody off the street. On top of that, the milk was routinely watered down, diminishing its nutrition even further. So that was in the cities. In the rural dairies, they had a better reputation and they made a valiant effort to get milk delivered fresh and cold by train. And in most smaller towns and cities, it was possible to get fresh milk delivered right to the door by the actual producer. These dairies took enormous pride in their products. Fiddler on the Roof comes to mind. Reb Tevye delivering his milk to the local people of the village. So um, the, the rural dairies who used the trains... The trains moved through the countryside before dawn, and they're picking up milk cans that waited on platforms. And the milk did not travel great distances. It was bottled and delivered fresh to doorsteps that very morning. Cans on their way to the creamery were kept cold by blocks of ice cut from the northern lakes in winter. Ice cutting was an important industry in northern states. Again, another industry surrounding the dairy business. The blocks of ice were packed in sawdust, available for in quantity from sawmills, and it kept right through the summer. Again, now you're keeping sawmills in business, or at least keeping up with their waste. So there was an amazing support structure for the rural and small town dairy industry. Honorable dairymen well understood that milk quality depended on healthy cows, clean milking practices, rapid chilling, and expeditious delivery. Milk itself tells the tale at the table just as unmistakably as fish does. Your nose knows when it is fresh. There are two ways to achieve a safe, edible milk product. Number one is by conscientious handling. Number two is by sterilizing and preserving the milk or fish or any other food after which it matters a great deal less how it is stored or for how long. Now, small dairies are able to exert quality control every step of the way, as we do, often even bottling and delivering their own milk and cherishing that one-on-one -on -one relationship with our customers. So we would support method number one. Larger, well-funded consortiums seeking control of dairying favored method number two. Their approach was to pull larger quantities of milk, was to, sorry, pool larger quantities of milk, drawing it from greater distances, overcome problem, overcoming problems of quality by heat treatment or pasteurization. And just as an aside, our milk, the milk from our dairies here in Virginia is collected at dairies in South, and distributed in dairies in South Carolina. That's how far we've come today with this. So you're drawing it from greater distances 
and you're overcoming the problems of quality by heat treatment or pasteurization. Now, the outcome of this struggle between these two methods of just good quality product or just sterilize it because it's dirty, um, that the outcome of that struggle was by no means a foregone conclusion. Heating changes the appearance, the flavor, the nutritive and culinary properties of milk, and none for the better. And as for its keeping qualities, everybody and his grandmother knew milk goes sour after a few days. It wasn't expected to keep. After all, that's why we make cheese. Everybody preferred fresh milk, and consumers understood perfectly well that pasteurization served as a substitute for quality. Um, dairymen who wanted to continue selling fresh milk geared up for more efficient delivery using ice, and it seemed about to make their case for quality control at the source as being the way to run dairies. Um, and quite apart from concern for their customers' preferences for a good quality milk, this also enabled them to maintain financial control of their own product. So they were winning this argument at this time. But then you had the winter of 1886. The winter of 1886, uh, it was the winter the, the lakes didn't freeze. There was no ice. And so without the ice, the case for fresh milk was lost just by default. Dairy farmers were forced to sell their milk to the middleman, as they do to this day. They have never been able to regain control over their own product. The mega dairy industry overwhelmed the little guy and continues to today. We are losing dairy farms every year, hundreds every year. And they just get bought up by these conglomerates that just have horrible conditions for their cows. And they can, you know, they they don't have to be clean because they're going to use pasteurization, right? So how do we get to this pasteurization where we accept it so much? Well, there was a fear campaign based on disease standards said to be unavoidable from unpasteurized milk. Indeed, this is likely to be true when milk from thousands of cows is pooled. Um, although then, as now, it's perfectly possible for herds to be clean and disease-free. What is not possible when fresh milk is pooled and transported great distances is to avoid its going sour and becoming unsaleable. So pasteurization was instituted for the benefit of distributors. A nervous public, uh, public was sold on a slew of new public health statutes that fostered the concept of pasteurization as being the only safe way to consume milk. You know, though we had survived as a species for tens of thousands of years on unpasteurized milk, today unpasteurized milk is demonized nearly as harshly as poison. And indeed, at that time, America was in the mood to sterilize everything possible. It was the heyday of the hospital white kitchen and bathroom. Dairymen were required to paint everything white, too, as part of the mystical association of whiteness with health and cleanliness. To this day, we dairy farmers must conform to public health regulations that are far more strict than those that are imposed on any other industry, including the very processing plants where milk is conveyed to be pasteurized. Well, that's as far as I'm going to go with the history today. In another episode, I'm going to talk about the demise of the family cow in the 20th century and how we have evolved in terms of milk production today. There is a renaissance of desire for fresh milk from our own cow. Perhaps the family cow will return in great numbers, or at the very least, family will buy their milk from a nearby farmer whom they know. More and more will want to buy a share in a cow herd, paying the farmer to house, care for, maintain, and milk their cows for them. Herd shares are gaining in popularity here in Virginia, and uh, we're currently looking into possibility of providing butter, yogurt, and some fresh cheese to folks just like you who want to own a family cow, but you don't have the time, place, or know-how to properly care for her. So we'll take care of that for you. You'll just stop by the homestead and pick it up each week. What do you think? Our recipe today is ghee. Um, making ghee is a process I enjoy. It's 
it has that quality of cheese making where you're standing and stirring for a little while. It's only a little while compared to how much you stand and stir for cheese. But anyway, I enjoy it. And it yields a wonderful cooking medium. Uh, and for those of you who might be unfamiliar, ghee is an unsalted butter that has had the milk solids removed after, after separating the butter fat. And it results in a beautiful golden pure fat um, with an unusually high smoking point. So um, this means that ghee and its cousin, clarified butter, is remarkably stable, even at high temperatures. Um, the process for making clarified butter is similar to that of making ghee. Ghee is simply cooked longer and it has more contact with the browning milk solids, in turn lending a different flavor profile, kind of a toasted, caramelized profile. So here's some tips for cooking with ghee. Number one, you want to use less. If you've ever cooked with ghee before, just if you've never cooked before, sorry, you never cooked with ghee before, go easy to start. I found that I typically need less throughout the process compared with, say, olive oil. Uh, wok cooking or stir fry is an exercise in high temperature intensity. Now that can be hard on oils and you end up having the oils break down and not in a good way. So ghee is a good option as long as it works for the flavors you're cooking. I don't think it works alongside soy sauce, for example. But a quick vegetable stir fry, that's a winner. Now the best uh, number three uh, tip here, uh, the, in my opinion, the best ghee comes from homemade butter, meaning you first make the butter from fresh cream that you got from your herd share, and then you turn that butter into ghee. And you might try making cultured butter and then turning that into ghee, because that will give your ghee just a little bit different flavor, but it'll still be that um, stable oil, a stable cooking medium. It's not really oil. Um, and the last tip, ghee can be stored unopened in a cool, dark place for nine months. Once it's opened, a jar can be kept on your countertop for three months. And beyond that, an open jar can be stored in the refrigerator for up to a year. How's that for shelf life, right? You'll know if it goes bad. It'll, it'll smell rancid. All right, so what do you need to make ghee? You need a couple of pounds of unsalted butter. I've used salted as well, so... You, you can go with that. And you're going to add a pinch of salt if it is unsalted anyway. But again, that's optional. Using salt is completely optional. Most of your cooking oils are not salted. So, and it is a cooking medium. All right, what do you do? Number one, you're going to melt the butter in a saucepan over medium heat. It's going to start to bubble and it'll separate. And the whey, the milk whey will float to the surface and it creates a foam. And so you skim the whey off as it arises. You just skim that off. Um, you can compost it and then continue to cook the butter un until it turns clear and the milk solids are going to sink to the bottom. There'll be these little pebbles, little tiny, tiny, um, gosh, they're smaller than peas, bigger than rice. Um, and so you're just, you're just cooking that until it turns clear and those milk solids sink to the bottom. Now this is clarified butter. You could actually stop here and have clarified butter. But for ghee, you're going to continue to cook your butter until the milk solids brown lightly on the bottom of the pan. And it's going to smell like popcorn butter. It's lovely. Then you're going to remove the pan from the heat and you're going to uh, add salt optionally. Again, that's optional. You don't have to add salt. And then you're going to cool it for a couple of minutes. Then pour it through a fine mesh strainer or a cheesecloth or a coffee filter or something like that. And then you're going to store that ghee in a tightly sealed mason jar. and Or you can just put it in the refrigerator, depending on how much you have and how long you're, you're planning to keep it. Use it in place of almost any cooking oil. It's going to add butter flavor without burning. Butter burns pretty easily, but ghee will not. A little note, if the butter turns too dark brown or black, you, you burned it, you're going to need to start over with that. All right, that's it for today. I hope you have a better homestead. I hope we. I hope to have better homestead news next week. We checked Buttercup today, and she looks like she might give birth in the next two to three days. So pray for her, please. She had trouble last time. Um, I hope you enjoyed the history of milk tour. And uh, lots of people say we are not meant to drink milk. However, we have been doing so for thousands of years and have prospered as a species. 
Lots of people say that no other animal drinks milk after a certain age. Um, you know, perhaps that's just because they're not smart enough to figure out how to squeeze that teat and get that luscious white nectar out. And for sure, anyone who's ever had a barn cat in the dairy knows that cats will most definitely continue to drink milk when it's offered to them. Um, they would just have a real problem getting those paws, trying trying to get at it themselves to use those paws on a cow teat. It ain't going to work. <laughs> Lastly, give that ghee recipe a try. Homemade butter and other natural animal fats are very healthy. Humans have survived on animal fats for thousands of years. Ghee is a great way to preserve that milk, cream, or butter for a long time. It's an excellent cooking medium. And ghee is even used in traditional Ayurvedic medicine. Ayurvedic medicine is one of the world's oldest holistic healing systems. It was developed more than 3,000 years ago in India. Um, it's based on the belief that health and wellness depend on a delicate balance between mind, body, and spirit. And that's a beautiful thought to end with. As always, I'm here to help you taste the traditional touch. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, may God fill your life with grace and peace.